depression is a topic that's been close to my heart and there are numerous people who go through depression the struggle is real on an everyday basis and yet it's a topic that people struggle to open up and talk about especially in the church today and in general there's a lot of stigma associated with it so what we're going to do this evening is to spend some time understanding depression um have you ever wondered what the bible has to say about depression we'll be taking a look at that today as well and we'll also spend some time learning how we can manage depression we understand that all of you who are here uh, are either going through depression or at, at some point been through depression or you know somebody who's going through depression and we understand that depression can be at varying levels of intensity uh there is depression that people face commonly and there is depression that has clinical implications as well and i want to let you know that today we will be talking from a non clinical perspective i would also like to reiterate the fact that while not everyone needs medication to manage depression some people do and if you are someone who is currently taking medication we would advise you to follow your doctor's directions and in addition to that you may consider adopting and supplementing your health with some of the things that you hear from us today uh so as we go forward i would just like to introduce the other two speakers who are with us this evening pastor vasudevan and dr joseph pastor vasudevan is a man of varied interests uh two unique things that stand out to me are that he is a stand up comedian with a love for the hebrew language uh he has a passionate heart for god and people in over decades over four decades he has served through pastoring churches and through counseling people and uh pastor is currently based out of bangalore uh dr joseph is a qualified medical doctor he is a practicing neuroscientist who's uh, currently pursuing his phd degree in the hebrew university of jerusalem uh, which is in israel and he is also an adjunct faculty in the school of natural sciences and engineering uh, at the national institute of advanced sciences in bangalore uh, he and his wife uh, uh, his wife is also a medical doctor and they were recently blessed with a baby boy He has a strong passion for the gospel of Christ and uh, both uh, Dr Joseph and Pastor Vasu they seem to be uh, they seem to enjoy learning mutually from each other and, and uh, this past week spending time with them has been really refreshing for me uh, so that's uh, both our speakers and uh, finally before we begin i just want to add that as we go through the session this evening If you have any questions at any point feel free to use the chat box if you would like to keep your questions confidential you can choose to chat privately either with me or with anita uh um, you can choose the chat option from below on your screen and change the setting using a small there's a small downward arrow from there you can uh you can change that from everyone to andrea or anita and you can send it privately to us So, Pastor Vasu, you can take over right now. Oh, thank you, thank you, Andrea, thank you, Anita, and Dr. Joseph. Thank you for each one who has joined us. And uh, in no way, I need to say that I'm not an expert in this subject. But someone, as Andrea said, I have gone through depression myself. There was one time in my life, I think, for more than a month. For more than a month, I did not read the Bible. I could not pray. and i just withdrew and i went into a deep depression because of uh of my situation at that time i finished my studies i could not find a ministry and i went into a deep depression but by god's grace i came out of it and i cannot say that after that i've never had struggles of depression there were many many times in my ministry uh i would have had a nervous breakdown there was a time in my life that i just i did not have only three things i did not have a job my children had no school to go and um, we had no place to stay a very good combination and god said to me 
Now, do you believe in me? I said, who else is there? <laughs> who else is there? And, and that, so there are many, many times in my life I've gone through that. So I, I'm not sharing something that, you know, I feel, oh, uh, I know it all. No, I don't know. I don't know anything about any subject anyway. But a person who has experienced a little bit of depression and a person who's still learning on how to cope with depression and still the Lord is teaching me so many things and it's so fascinating, you know, and it's so I do this with, with the power and the help of God, but I'm very, very passionate to share this and, uh, and I'm so happy that uh, Dr. Joseph and Andrea and Anita have helped us to put this together. Thank you. Okay, we can go to the next slide. We're just trying to understand these things and uh, we try to find out that many times, you know, depression is not something strange things happening. You know, at one time, Peter said, don't think something strange is happening. First Peter 4, 12. No, it is not. And what we're trying to do is trying to cope up and how do you manage this depression? Okay. This is roughly what we're going to cover. Okay. What is depression? Okay. It is generally a state of feeling helpless, worthless, and hopeless. It's a spectrum falling in different parts, experiencing various. So it is, it is uh, sometimes depression can come through in unknown sources. It could be some strange reason. We can't explain that. But generally, this is what you're feeling. Helplessness, worthlessness, and a sense of hopelessness. Okay. You can go to the next one now. The, these are the three lies which I believe very strongly that many depressed people believe. Many people, not all, many people. I'm, of no, I'm no good. Ordinary life is boring and I have no future. And we need to turn this around. Okay. Good. Andrea, you want to take over from there? Sure, Pastor. Uh, I, these are some of some of these uh, statements that you look here are um, are things that we've said ourselves probably. And uh, if you notice, there are actually verses that have been pulled out from the Bible. Uh, when we look that through Bible. There are different people, whether it's like. David or Job, Elijah, uh, different people have gone through those phases of feeling really low and feeling depressed. And so it helps to take consolation in the fact that, you know, we are not alone, that there are people that are heroes from the Bible who faced what we went through as well. And as uh, the verse in Proverbs 24, 16 says, though the righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. And that's uh, that's what we need to hold on. Pastor, would you want to continue? For sure. Next so, few yeah. So, don't ever feel that you're alone in this one. Okay. We are, don't never look at these uh, people: Moses, Elijah, Jeremiah, Jonah, and all of them experience all of these kind of things. So, don't think some strange thing is happening to you. Don't let the devil put you into condemnation. That's what we want to say. Okay. So just this is what Jesus has said. He said, you know, we read that Jesus was despised and rejected by man. And listen to this, a man of suffering and, and familiar with grief, pain. In other versions, it says he was acquainted with grief and a person who had that. And yet it's very interesting that the Lord Jesus Christ also tells us that he has joy and he wants us to experience joy. Is fascinating that you could have grief and you can have pain and still experience joy. Our joy is not the not the absence of pain and problem. It is in the midst of joy. Okay, this is what Paul says. You know, it's very fascinating. Sorrowful yet always rejoicing. You know, you can have grief but still experience joy. 
You remember at one time Paul says, we do not grieve as the Gentiles. So there is a grieving for the believer, but there is hope and joy in the midst of that. And that's so fascinating. Okay, we can go to the next one. This is something that God revealed to me just, you know, 11 years ago, my wife was diagnosed with cancer. But just a month before that, you know, God revealed this to me in a very amazing way uh, from John uh, 16, 33. Life is not fair. Life is difficult. Life, people will let you down. In life, you will have financial difficulties. In life, you will have family problem. And in life, you will have sickness. And in life, you will face death. That's all. I love this quotation by E. Stanley Jones. Believers are not God cosmic pets. Sometimes some parts of the church Christians would try to teach us that if you are a Christian, you'll have no problem. And, um, and that's not true. That's not true. That is why Jesus, our Lord said, uh, you know, this, I love this quotation by Oswald Chambers. Andrea, can you read this one? Yes, Pastor. No Christian makes much progress in the Christian life until he realizes that life is more chaotic and tragic than orderly. This is just welcome to the club. This is just one thing that we will have to understand. You will grow. Oswald Chambers actually said, you will grow in your spiritual life and you have a better understanding of reality if you accept the fact that life in this, in this broken world is more tragic than orderly. You know, all of us would like to have order. I should, I should be born in a wonderful family. My father and mother should be the best parents. I must go to the best schools. I must go to the best college. I must get, uh, get admission to the best college. I must get the best job. I must get a girl who's fair and lovely, even if she's wearing fair and lovely cream, but I must have a fair and lovely girl, and I must have beautiful children, they must get married, and everything should be all right. <laughs> and then God says, I didn't have it that way. I came to the earth, they crucified me. That's why somebody said so beautifully, Jesus is not going to come back, land on the earth, he's going to be in the sky, and we're going to be caught up, because the first time he came, he got crucified. <laughs> That's how life operates. But will we start living in spite of that? No Christian, yeah. Now this is something we all have to understand. We all will go through this one. It may be a slightly different form of suffering. I always would like to say, each suffering is unique. Suffering is not justifiable, nor is it equal. But God says, God is faithful. He will never allow you to go beyond your ability to bear. You know, I was always, uh, I love the word escape. The word escape. But the word escape, in many versions, he said, you provide a way of escape. But actually, this is the better one. He will provide a way so that you can endure it. Hallelujah. So your situation may be difficult. But God will give you the grace to endure it. Thank you. Next, next one. I think uh, setting that, uh, setting yeah. the tone in that sense of, uh, you know, God will help us endure it is really helpful. And now we're just going to spend some time trying to understand what really depression is. Uh, so as the slide says, depression is not a malfunction. Uh, the depression is often looked at as a handicap and just as we wouldn't trivia trivialize any other physical ailment but rather tend to it and take care of ourselves we need to also look after ourselves when we go through depression so depression is a signal uh, if we do not take it seriously it can lead to other things so just as fever can be an indicator of uh, physical sickness, depression, if unattended, can also lead to further complications. So as we've been hearing so far, depression uh, involves a neg negative state of uh, being where you feel, where you're thinking negatively or you're feeling negative uh, or our actions can reflect that and it calls for the change. 
so as um, as the sport says just as just because you are depressed it doesn't mean um, you are weak or you are crazy and it most cer- certainly does not mean that you are a machine with broken parts we are merely human beings with unmet needs and so with that we're going to look at some of the causes of um, depression uh, before we do that why do we know, need to know what causes depression because knowing what causes depression will help us identify what triggers our negative thinking or emotions and behavior and unless we know what these triggers are how will we know how we can help ourselves so going back to that fever analogy if we don't know what is causing the fever how will we know what medication to take also knowing what causes depression will be helpful for us to identify and understand someone who's going through depression so we're going to start off by looking at some of uh, some uh, at biological causes so studies have shown that there is a 37% uh, chance that depression can be genetically inherited but for those of us who carry this gene and are born with it the gene has to be activated by by and by our environment by something that happens in our life after we are born have you ever thought about how sickness came into the world uh, because god did not create sickness it was a consequence of man's fall but thankfully god has also made a way out of it for us and we'll talk more on this later so for now we'll move on to looking at some of the psychosocial causes of depression so as we see work uh, when we feel like you know we are not in control or when we have little control in our place of work Uh, and we feel that we don't have any sense of autonomy uh, or even if we feel unappreciated or devalued it can create a negative feeling in us even without us sometimes consciously realizing it feeling lonely is another cause we look more at it uh, in a minute lack of uh, meaningful values that is when we are more focused on things of the world like our job promotion money um it's it's when we become more focused on materialism and the bible clearly tells us where our treasure is that's where our heart is and so uh where our treasure is is a reflection of how we feel it. that's where our heart is at so we we need to be mindful of what we are pursuing we are made in god's likeness and we share in his nature and we're not wired to simply pursue meaningless things childhood trauma is another cause which we will look at again uh, in a minute disconnection from the natural world and feeling hopeless uh lacking a sense of passion and purpose i think this will also cover further along the uh, presentation so uh going back to loneliness god made us to be relational people yet somehow we are the loneliest society in human history um as this quote says you know as bees live in a hive we were meant to live in a tribe however with the fast paced world we live in we often struggle maintaining genuine and meaningful relationships that uh, and we end up battling loneliness uh of course sometimes uh being lonely can be due to inevitable reasons like our job may take us away from where we were used to like uh, where we had our community uh it may take us to somewhere where we are unfamiliar and we may be struggling to make genuine connections in this place however loneliness uh can also be something that we feel despite being surrounded by people it can stem from an inability to connect or relate with the people around us so there we go Lo- loneliness can be a f- big factor that contributes to depression but an even bigger contributor uh, contributor to depression is childhood tra- trauma uh every child is born with a need to be loved and feel belonged so as a child 
failing to experience the love of parents or significant caregivers, despite them being present, can create a vacuum in a child. So a child can also feel or may experience the spirit of orphanhood when they don't feel loved the way they, are, they expect to be loved. After all, you know, each of us have different love languages and while as adults ourselves, we struggle with knowing and understanding each other's love language and expressing, it's all the more difficult for a child to comprehend that uh, or know that they are loved. Uh, maybe it's not the way that they expect that love is shown. Um, so we probably feel not accepted when we, when we fail to feel that love, we may not feel accepted. We may feel rejected or not valued and this can affect how we see ourselves and how we value ourselves. And both of that can cause depression. Uh, feeling of worthlessness can cause uh, depression. So also coming from dysfunctional and broken families uh, can affect us emotionally uh, or if, a person, if there's lack in experiencing love or acceptance and having good relationship among family members, uh, the way God designed it to be, that can also cause uh, loneliness and depression. And uh, finally, if we look at rejection, whether it comes from home or school, it can be one tiny failure that can break a child. And if the child is not taught how to handle them properly, then we may carry that into our adult years and it may continue. Another uh, aspect that we look at is loss of hope that can cause depression. Losing hope because of circumstances that are beyond our control. Uh, times like now, being stuck in a pandemic with no sense of control and we just miss the things that we were once able to do and that can make us sad. Or there can be unresolved conflicts with close ties, broken relationships from the past, or even unhealthy relationships that we have now or we are choosing to hold on to uh, can hurt us deeply. At the same time, physical sickness in any form can also put us down. And uh, it can also be vice versa. Depression can also lead to physical ailments in us. Or we may feel stuck in an unpleasant lifestyle uh, they, there may be lifestyle, lifestyle choices, uh, addictions or habits that we are used to, which started out as once trying to fit in with the crowd, but now we're struggling to pull back from things like, that could be anything from the kind of food we eat to, sleep, to our sleeping patterns, to smoking or alcohol or gambling, anything. And all of this can create a negative uh, thought or feeling or behavior in us and we can struggle to be, break free from them. Uh, and while these are causes uh, that have most commonly been identified to make a person depressed, there are also times we cannot really figure out uh, what, what that unpleasant or that gnawing feeling is. And the reason may be unknown, uh, but that's... Uh, that's okay because we, God still makes a way out for us. And um, Pastor Vasu will now just continue talking a little bit more on the causes of depression. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you. That's, it's okay not to be okay all the time. Yeah. And uh, as long as uh, Dr. Jerry Duncan has, is one of my mentors and has been training me in the area of counseling. He's been a counselor for about 40 years. And when I asked him what depression is, this is what he said. It is a state of hopelessness and helplessness marked by a lack of joy. And I like it. So, yes, it could be chemical imbalance, as Andrea was trying to tell us. And, uh, and then there is this learned helplessness. And we will talk a little bit about that. And stuck in grief, you probably experience a loss of something, loss of a loved one, loss of a job, loss of a, you know, you wanted to marry somebody, but somebody else got married. And it's a very painful thing. And some grief, some loss has taken place. And uh, sometimes you can get stuck in the guilt, or you can get stuck in, in uh, anger, or you can get stuck in depression, 
because of the great loss and you get stuck there and we are trying to slowly say lord take us away from this one back into life stream okay so helplessness yeah this is what we learn what is learn helplessness this is a phrase that psychologists would love to use these words and i try to use uh, big words to just impress you but don't get impressed okay my wife is never impressed about me okay false and this underestimation of the ability to grow feeling ill ill equipped to progress no i will never progress believing lies about your capacity told to you by your, told to you in early childhood you know as andy was telling about early childhood the damage sometimes can happen can in our own family sometimes unconsciously our parents can do it in the schools it happens you know a person wrote a book is their life after high school our teachers can actually destroy us you're old, you're hopeless you can never come up in life you will end up as a driver or whatever i don't have it in me i'll never be able to and you get stuck in these things you know at one time my in my seminary training one teacher told me that i'll never be a teacher i can be a preacher but i'll never be a teacher but then my wife so lovingly bought a white board for me i started writing now i cannot teach without black board or a white board and so you can change it you don't need to get stuck in that hopelessness false sense of inadequacy you know this is something that you have to change you are adequate as paul says our adequacy comes from god the lie that undermines your ability prevents growth listen to the last part of it i came the devil comes to steal to kill and destroy i came that you may have life and have it to its full don't get stuck you know i always tell my story that a train actually train was uh, people were traveling in a train and uh, the final destination was some place in in bihar that is the final destination but in one particular compartment nobody was getting down nobody was getting down everybody is sitting there sad very discouraged and he comes into that compartment with his gun and he points to the uh, passengers in that compartment and says give me all your jewels give me all your money i will shoot you and the guys in that compartment are not shaken they are not worried they hardly look at him he says this is a real gun when i'll shoot you give me your your money give me your jewels after much threatening one of the uh, passengers look at the terrorist and say lazily you must be new to bihar we have already been robbed <laughs> we have nothing to give you you know many believers are robbed stolen and killed and they don't realize and i want to say this evening god jesus christ our lord says i want you to have life and life full abundantly super abundantly in the other version they say life that you never thought possible don't get stuck there's a beautiful story about the elephant you know this is what the the next slide is an elephant when it grows up you go to the next slide yeah a, a elephant there is grown up string actually very very flimsy kind of a, a rope and the elephant is stuck there because it cannot go one leg is stuck to the peg but what happens is at that age when the elephant is small has no strength it cannot take it cannot free himself free itself but what happens because it has been living in that kind of a situation for many many years even though elephant has grown very big and very strong can actually knock off the peg and go free it has learned and said no 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 there is no use and has given up and will get stuck there that's the story of helplessness in many areas devil tells you i don't think you can become normal again i don't think you can go back to activities again i don't think you can start loving and going back to normal life 
you are stuck here that is a lie the power of god says i can empower you and you can move on okay we'll go to the next one but you know god sees the troubles of the afflicted it's a very beautiful verse afflicted you consider their grief hallelujah and take it in your hand the victim commits themselves to you and you are the helper of the fatherless hallelujah i always say this that even for a millisecond you don't need to feel helpless i think it is in second cor a fourth chapter where teen um second corinthians i'm sorry we didn't get it, but we read this was second corinthians 6 that um sekin i will be their father to you i will be a father to you you shall be sons and daughters to me says the lord almighty hallelujah if bill gates says you are my son from today onwards but somebody greater than he says my son my you are my son i will take my help comes from the lord and and earth shall go to the next one Uh, these three people that i fascinated with charles spurgeon was a great preacher and i mean he wrote faith check book one of my fav- my wife's favorite book is faith check book because you have promises for day charles spurgeon when he was a young pastor uh, when he was conducting service somebody said fire fire falsely and i think six people died in the stampede six people died and he went through that grief and that pain and that depression for many many years he struggled with it what is fascinating about charles spurgeon is the fact that even though he had the struggle with depression he continued to minister and was a great blessing and he still talks about joy and happiness fascinating thing so it is quite all right to go through depression and feel that but don't ever give up just move on William Carey is another person his his wife when she when they came to india deep depression actually she had to be locked up one of his sons died his printing press where he did the entire sanskrit dictionary and the bible it got burned down and he experienced one disappointment after another he's called the father of missions because he was one of the great missionary who came to india and in his diary with his wife's condition his son death the burning down of the entire printing he had to do the entire thing from the first page william carey wrote this down i am disappointed but now we all have to learn i have to learn sometimes get out of it Elizabeth with Elliot is a beautiful beautiful story i'm sure many of you know but i don't know whether many of you know this that Elizabeth Elliot wife husband died as a martyr <coughs> she went and served the same people for 16 years <coughs> as a single mother with a daughter she served those people in fact one time her daughters looked at those people the tribal people that she was working with and as mom is this one of these men my daddy and there is with elias elias said to her daughter no my daughter they are not your daddy in fact they are the people who killed your daddy in spite of the work there she comes back to america after 16 years of work she marries a theologian and after 3 years of marriage to this second husband he dies of cancer and then she marries again now listen to what she says else with elliot the yes go, go go to the next one yeah and can you read this one when i went back to my jungle station after the death of my first husband jim elliot i was faced with many confusions and uncertainties i had a many new roles besides that of being a single parent and a widow I was alone on a jungle station that Jim and I had managed had manned together. 
I had to learn to do all kinds of things which I was not trained or prepared in any way to do. It was a great help to me to simply do the next thing. Amen. Just go ahead and do the next thing. Yes, it's painful. Just go ahead. Don't get stuck. Okay. Okay. When you feel, okay, this is very, very important. What you feed will grow. What you starve will die. If you can keep, keep, keep thinking of the negative things that happened and the losses that you went through and keep meditating on that, it will grow. It's like having a white cat and a black cat. If you keep feeding the white cat and if you starve the black cat, the black cat ultimately will die out. So you can choose what you want to think. What? So this is a very important thing. What you starve will, will die away. Yeah. Self pity is pride turned inward. And some don't go there to be continuously sad is rebellion against God now actually uh, the rabbis uh, and we were saying that I love the Jewish culture and the old ancient Hebrew they actually the rabbis said you know that to be sad is rebellion and disobedience so we, you and I will experience sadness sometime or the other but don't get stuck. If you get stuck, in fact, the Jewish, the rabbis actually taught that the main target of This is one line that I remember studying in seminary. So, sorry, sir. So, uh, this line I remember. The line is, allow nothing to rob you of God's joy in your heart. That's all. And by and large, I try to practice this all the days of my life. A spirit of entitlement is spreading that everything good should happen to me. Everybody must honor me, respect me. Nothing bad should happen to me. Everything should go well. I always be the head. I should never be the tail. Now everything should go well. That doesn't happen. This definition of Susanna Vesni, I love very much. And can you read this? Yes, Pastor. Take this rule. Whatever weakens your reason, impairs the tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense of God, or takes away your relish of spiritual things. In short, whatever increases the strength and authority of your body over your mind, that thing is sin to you, however innocent it may be in itself. Don't let self-pity, don't let the sense of feeling of inadequacy, don't let any of these things destroy you. Whatever obscures your sense of God, let God be absolutely real to you. His power and grace upon your life. Okay. Thank you. Okay. This is one of the rabbis said. Discomfort is a nature way of saying it's time to grow. Growth will always have pain. Will always have pain. But when you grow, you get benefited. Okay. Yeah. We can see this now. Lobster. Yeah. when it has to grow yeah it has to remove that hard part actually what the, the lobster does is goes to the rock and sheds the hard part so the lobster grows because it drops against a rock and comes out of that shell when it's growing the shell is a hindrance so one of my teachers, the rabbi was saying, 
thank God the lobster didn't have a doctor. Otherwise, they give him a painkiller or something to prevent the growth. Then we'll have a small lobster. We can't enjoy it while eating. But the lobster grows because it goes to the rock and sheds the hard part, and then it again is able to grow. Growth is always painful, but don't become victimized. Or don't let the pain paralyze you. Peace, hallelujah! In the world, you will have tribulation. He never told us we'll have picnic. He never told us we'll have picnic. No, the self that the Christian. L.T. Jaitan is a great Bible teacher, and uh, and he said this many years ago, and it stuck with me. Okay, so you and I are made amazingly, wonderfully, amazingly wonderfully. I praise you because. We have, you have been made little lower than God. You know, while we are trying to put this slide up, we had a lot of debate among us. Should we really put this? Because in most versions it says little lower than angel. Wrong version. If this is the one, little low God. The image of God. It is awesome. It is simply awesome. You and I need to realize you are simply breathtaking. You know, this changed my life actually. When I realized I am breathtaking and I am awesome, and that I am not an ordinary person, ecological, spiritual well-being, that is the second most important thing. And then your family, and then your job, and everything else. Okay. The next one. Yeah, as we look, uh, we've, we've been looking at psychosocial causes and now we're looking at um, spiritual causes. Uh, and as we, you know, read in uh, Ephesians 6, 12, Bible says our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the powers of darkness and against the forces of wickedness in heavy places. And look at Job. Uh, he did not know what was happening. And he began to feel the weight of it. He, he was sorrow. He was experiencing uh, trauma in that. Knowledge. And as A.W. Tozer puts it, behind the scenes, there is a God who has not authority. consequences of sin. Sometimes it is true that uh, that any form of uh, sickness, including depression, can be a generational curse uh, activated by our environment. However, So we can enjoy the freedom that he gives, even from depression. So we have freedom in Christ, through Christ. At the same time, God allows us to go through sickness as well. That doesn't mean we're cursed or that we've sinned or that we deserve sickness as a or sickness or depression as a punishment of some sort. And most certainly it does not mean that God does not love, love us or has forsaken us. Absolutely not. These are lies that Satan may try to feed us. And at such times, it's important to remember that God gives his toughest battles to his strongest soldiers. We may not find complete healing and it may be a thorn in our flesh, as Paul says, that also uh, 
means that we can overcome it with god's help his grace is sufficient and i just want to read this version uh, the message version of second corinthians 12 9 it says uh, and then he he told me my grace is enough it's all you need my strength comes into its own in your weakness once i heard that i quit focusing on the handicap and began appreciating the gift now i take limitations in stride and with good cheer these limitations that cut me down to size abuse accidents opposition bad break i just let christ take over and so the weaker i get the stronger i become a person who is whole is one who pursues life even in the midst of danger and it also helps to remember that we carry the message of christ in unadorned clay pots in the unadorned clay pots of our ordinary life and so though we are surrounded by battles uh, though we feel tortured or if there's mockery or any kind of uh, you know a uh, pressure that we feel in that sense we know that christ lived through it and he gives us the grace to live through it as well the ultimate consolation though is this nothing irredeemable has happened to us or can happen to us for we know that in christ in god all things work together for the good of those who love him and he has called us according to his purpose thank you thank you andrea thank you and you know that code by dallas will add is so wonderful and the and the bible reference in corinthians is so so wonderful just go back to the reference uh, yeah uh, paul when god says my grace is sufficient for you no that one yeah opposition bad breaks abuse accidents all of this is part that does not cut me down to size it does not need to we can still in the power of god move on although i am weak i can get that strong you now let the weak say i am strong it is either wrong the worst psychology or the greatest psychology because if god says it then we too can say and i am weak then i am strong thank you it's just about the 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 genes and gender i know dr joseph will cut, uh, talk on that but just want to say this there's an amazing new study in the science of medicine it's called it's epigenetics behavior epigenetics and and it's it's called neuroplasticity all of them says that even though we come with the possibility in our genes with the power and the grace of god and when we change our thinking and the way we start living it can change everything even the expression of our genes because remember paul says god makes all things new if anyone is in christ jesus is a new creature the old has passed away so slowly science is catching up i always call science as a tube like because they will always catch up with what the bible already said many many years ago thank you we'll just move on um this is something that very fascinates me you know when you see the people that are hanging around with david they were these are people distressed deaf disconnected contented gathered around him and he became their commander how do you like to be a commander of that kind of people and yet god uses his ordinary people and makes them extraordinary let the weak say i am strong next one i love this verse so much i don't want any of you to feel that you know i'm stuck no no you're not okay uh and you can you read it yes pastor take a good look friends at who you were when you got called into this life i don't see many of the brightest and the best among you not many influential not many from high society families isn't it obvious that god deliberately chose men and women that the culture overlooks and exploits and abuses 
shows the nobodies to expose Amen. the hollow pretensions of the somebodies. Amen. Everything that we have, right thinking and right living, a clean slate and a fresh start comes from God by the way of Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, sometimes we just have to replace the lies that we believe in. God, Jesus says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is the truth. Replace the lies with the truth of God's word. And my, yeah, sorry, just go back to the next one. My people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. When we realize that how much God can empower us in the midst of this, it's amazing. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is the truth. Replace the lies with God's word. Okay, God's word, then start feeling, thinking, and living the truth. In the Hebrew understanding of knowing the truth, when you know the fact that God loves you and is with you, it changes your feeling, your thinking, and the way you live. Okay, the next one. I love this one. What God tells you to do, he will not do it for you. He takes you take courage. He says you be a good cheer like God tells Joshua be courageous now that's a command it's not an option it's a command to be courageous okay so what God tells you to do he will not do it for you okay and he's a, a baseball player who hurt his knee, knee very badly and a very good believer normally he would say after winning a champ he won a, a he did very well in game in a, in a particular game event and that reporter asked him hey your knee was very badly injured how did you play so well and he said these words sometimes you just have to play with pain he did extremely well in the game but the pain was reality but he still played hallelujah next one yeah this is something we all have to take comfort in that somewhere, the worst thing that we can do is, oh, nobody's suffering like me. The worst lie the devil tells us is, you are the only one who is suffering like this. <clears throat> you are the only family that are going through this pain. Everybody is happy. Everybody is doing well. You are the only one going through it. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Everybody is going through some kind of problem. Okay, we'll go to the next one. Oh, this is something that I want to say. Actually, I learned this from Dr. Joseph. Conscious experience is an internal awareness. Change the content of your consciousness from a negative false content to a positive and true content. Moment by moment, exercise this. Practice conscious knowledge of God's love presence and his care. For me, this is a very important slide. We are conscious of the negative things. Oh, that didn't happen. That didn't happen. Why that happened? Why that happened in my life? Why did that death happen in my life? And we are so focusing on that. Remember I told you earlier, whatever you feed will grow. What you starve will die. You need to change the content of your conscious. You know, there's a very famous Catholic saying that the Lord is called practicing the presence of God. If this is something that I am learning and I'm enjoying this, just enjoying the presence of God's love, His presence in my life. And that changed a lot for me. Thank you. Yeah, this is another verse, okay? And this is something that we can enjoy. Since you are experiencing the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. Hallelujah. There's fullness of joy. You know, in the beatitude, Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, where they shall see God. And if you see God, you will be extremely happy. If your heart is clean, you will see God and experience God. If you don't have anger and bitterness and jealousy and envy and any of this sin, your heart is clean, you will experience God in an amazing way and joy is a byproduct. Somehow in our churches, we have never taught that joy was something that we were created for. 
Okay. Next one. This is something that Martin Silgerman said. He, he's a father of positive psychology. He said, positive emotion is something that we need to experience. Being filled with gratitude. For me, it is very significant because they're all very biblical. And uh, uh, to have positive attitude. One of the definition of happy person is one who most of the time has positive emotion. That means sometimes we can have negative emotions, but develop a positive emotions, okay? Engagement. What do I do when time stands still? Relationship. Have an amazing, significant relationship with people. Do things that you thoroughly enjoy. You know, um, do things that you thoroughly enjoy. Meaning and purpose is so important. Do something that will bring happiness and joy to others. When you make others happy, you will become happy. You will become happy. Passion helps you to keep going. Recognize your talents. See the need in the world and connect with the two. That is all of us. You know, God has made you in an amazing way that what you can do, what God can do through you, he cannot do anything. He cannot do it through anybody else. Can I say that again? You are created amazingly, wonderfully to achieve something unique. And when you realize that, and when you realize your gifts and talents, God is going to use you. So always have a passion. Okay. And then you see this. Do you see a man skilled in his work? He'll stand before kings and he'll not stand before obscure men. Okay. Next one. This is something that I love. Okay. And you can read this one. Yes, Pastor. It is the sin that believes in nothing, cares for nothing, seeks to know nothing, interferes with nothing, enjoys nothing, loves nothing, hates nothing, finds purpose in nothing, lives for nothing, and remains alive only because there is nothing it would die for. What makes you to get up every day? You must have something that you'll do for others. You must have a reason to live. And once you begin to serve, you know, the only way to be happy is to make somebody else happy. The only reason God created you and me is to enjoy him, of course, to thoroughly enjoy him. And then with the enjoyment that you come because of him, you are serving and blessing mankind around you. If, if you have done good for one person that day, it's not wasted. Focus your, change your focus from yourself to others. I, I leads to illness. We, we leads to wellness. Dr. B.M. Hegde actually said that. Beautiful. You know, there was a lady who was came for counseling for many, many sessions. After, the, after a few sessions, and uh, she asked me and said, I think uh, your daughter I know, is, I taught her music. And I immediately told her, now you're well. Now you're concerned about other people, you'll become well. Focus, shift your focus from yourself to others. Listen to this. The son of man came not to be served, but to serve. Hallelujah. And when we bless others, God blesses us abundantly. This I love. The tragedy of life. Is what dies within inside a man while he's alive. You know, Norman Cousin was diagnosed with a very bad sickness, and the prognosis was very bad. The doctors gave him a few minutes to a few months to live. He actually began to seek uh, humorous comedy movies, and he became perfectly well. In fact, he lived many, many years after that. Even though the doctors had given him a few months, he lived long after that. So notice what died in you, don't let that die because Christ came to give you life and, and the devil comes to destroy and to kill. You remember that? It is slow death to be gloomy all the time. G.K. Chesterton said those beautiful words. He, I mean, he said, if you have faith, you'll have fun. You know, one of the service providers when mobiles came into first in our country, one of the service providers had a slogan, very beautiful. Get your fundas, get your fundas correctly and have funda. 
get your funders correctly god cares for you he loves you he will empower you get those foundation correctly you will have fun get busy living or you get busy dying what a sad thing when we are busy loving and enjoying god when we are busy loving people loving ourselves loving people serving them you will live all men die but all men not all men really live you know i believe this is one of the tragic things that in the church we don't have people who are fully alive with joy exuberance you know cs lewis said this beautiful word he said if there are 10 people who are joyful and happy and enjoying the christian life in one year the whole world will become christians so that's what cs lewis said but tragically in churches today we don't have joyful happy people not that they don't have problem but they learn to live with that with joy the glory of god is a man fully alive amen not that we don't have problems in the midst of that to be fully alive thank you next one oh this i love this is something i love and you can you read this one kids laugh 400 times a day adults laugh 16 times a day we lose 384 laughs in a day in a process i called adulteration sometimes the family has done it sometimes sadly schools have done it sometimes sadly the church has done it and you have to multiply three uh, 384 the many years that we lived and it says the adult average the adults laugh 16 times i think it is over exaggeration i think no <laughs> we laugh less than that one but i'll tell you what this adulteration that has taken place we have normalized it we have said this is part of christianity and we have lived this way failing to realize that Christ came to give us life. You know, in 1 Peter 1, 8, it says, uh, though you have not seen him, yet you believe in him. Though you have not seen him, yet you trust in him. In the Message Bible, it says, with joy inexpressible and full of glory. The Message Bible says, with laughter and singing. So sometimes when I go to a church and I crack a joke and they don't laugh, I say, I'll be praying for your salvation. That's all. Because if they're not able to laugh, they have a severe problem. Okay, good. Laughing and being happy is a requirement. It is a social obligation. I am socially obligated to be happy and joyful for my wife. Because no wife would like to live with a sad husband. The reverse is also true. You know, this is something that does don't laugh to, or tomorrow you'll cry. I don't know. We, we must have heard this in school. The fellow thinks he's a Socrates or some great philosopher. Hey, don't laugh too much. Tomorrow you'll cry. And we have listened to that. Okay. Uh, I love this one. God will hold you accountable for all the legitimate pleasure you did not enjoy. If you have faith, you will have fun. Hallelujah. A merry heart is a good medicine. A joyful mind causes healing. But a broken spirit dries up the bone. Thank you. Okay, I love this definition of laziness. Does the laziness come? Next one. Are we finished that, Andrea? Hello? Yes, yes, Pastor, we've uh, finished, finished that. Finished? Okay, yeah. here we go, Dr. Joseph. No? Go ahead, Andrea. I think uh, Dr. Joseph will take over now and he'll be giving us some practical uh, ways to cope with depression. Thank you, Andrea. So now that we have have a clear idea about the psychological and spiritual aspects of depression from uh, Pastor and Andrea, I'll be talking about some very simple practical steps that anyone can take to bounce out of that feeling of loneliness or what the Bible describes in the book of Isaiah as the spirit of heaviness. It's what we call depression today, but it was there even in Old Testament times, as you heard about the uh, Bible heroes, they had the spirit of heaviness. 
So what are the practical things we can do? Uh, well, first of all, uh, what we must understand is depression isn't always because of some chemical imbalance which requires um, medication. Uh, sometimes it is, but very often it is not. Now, uh, whatever I s suggest here, whatever advice I give out here, even if, uh, if, if someone is taking medication, it's not meant to replace it or substitute it, only to supplement it. So it's supposed to add on to whatever uh, is being taken, if anything is being taken currently. As far as depression is generally concerned, uh, it's not necessarily always because of chemical balance. Very often it is because of something called life imbalances. Uh, and those life imbalances happen because of that uh, notorious thing that everyone experiences on a day-to-day -day basis called stress. Uh, stress has now become the very central story of every person living in the modern world and stress has, as a result, affected the mental health uh, significantly. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. So what is stress? Stress is actually a very normal, a very physiological response of the human body uh, to help us get out of some kind of difficult situation. It was useful back in the days when our ancestors were surviving out there in the jungle uh, with so many things uh, going against us, wild animals, tiger, lion, bear, uh, snake, uh, scorpion, you have to deal with all sorts of things, all sorts of threats for our survival. In those situations, it makes sense to have stress uh, on the body to help us get out of it. But in our modern world, what has happened is we've moved from outdoors to indoors and our very physical oriented life has become an increasingly sedentary one and a mental one mostly. Uh, but the thing is, the threats which existed back then uh, with the, uh, wild animals and predators, they have not left. It's, they've just been replaced with different types of threats. Now we face the threat of economic turmoil, political instability, uh, job security, salary payment. These are the type of stresses which are now the tigers and lions which are chasing us around. So the body, just like in our ancestors' case, it also responds in a, uh, in a, in a manner which will help deal with the situation. But obviously because there's nothing physical in these threats, uh, what happens is the body has to suffer the ill effects of the stressful response. And one of the main effects is more than on the body, on the brain, and particularly the mind. And that uh, one effect is depression. Right? So that's really an unwanted, undesirable effect of stress. And uh, one of the most important uh, victims uh, of normal physiological activity uh, when stress comes and attacks us is our sleep. In fact, uh, sleep today in the medical field has become uh, one of the main uh, markers of mental health or main indicators of how uh, mentally stable and uh, normal you are. So uh, this is easily understood from this illustration that is the, uh, in fact, this has become a paradigm in uh, medicine today. Sleep is to the brain what rest is to the body. That is the body needs rest, the body doesn't need sleep. The brain doesn't need rest, the brain needs sleep. Sleep is something different from rest. Sleep is the rest of the brain. When we say the word rest, that's just for the body. Uh, the difference is this, you just think about it like this. That is, say that you engage in some very strenuous activity for several hours and you don't even give your body a single minute break. What's gonna happen? Your body is going to feel the effect of that in the form of pain in every muscle and joint in the body. It's the same thing with the brain. When you don't give the brain sufficient, adequate time for it to rejuvenate with the help of sleep, that's what sleep is. Sleep is nothing more than a rejuvenation for the brain. One of the effects is the manifestation of symptoms of depression. So uh, in popular culture, you know, uh, sleep is not seen as something which is very favorable or acceptable. In fact, in many cultures, for example, in Japan, Sleep is considered a sign of laziness. Uh, only lazy people who are ambitionless and without drive for success or any desire for a good future, they uh, spend a lot of time in sleep. But the truth, uh, nothing can be further from the truth. For example, in this next slide, 
you may be familiar with this man, Albert Einstein. He's a renowned physicist who gave us the theory of relativity and quantum theory and many brilliant technologies which we can't even imagine living without today. For example, GPS and lasers, they stem directly from his work. And uh, he was a big advocate for sleep. In fact, he would sleep almost 10 hours a day and he would tell others to do so because for him, sleep was necessary to be creative. Another very famous uh, US inventor, Thomas Edison, who invented the light bulb, he believed in doing something called power naps, where he takes 20 minute naps, uh, short interval sleep, uh, uh, sleep uh, during the day. You can see here in this upper quadrant in the picture, you can see uh, him sleeping on the grass while his colleagues in a very important business meeting, they're discussing the remaining details of the business. He said, I have to just take my power nap and then I'll get back to you. Now, if you look lower down, you can see him sleeping on a hard bench in his laboratory. Uh, in fact, there are many photos of uh, Thomas Edison uh, sleeping in his laboratory. Even in his library, he kept a small little bed installed there. So uh, he felt it boosted his, uh, his creativity and productivity. So how do we get good sleep? Well, uh, the people, the experts in medicine who actually study sleep, they're called sleep medicine specialists. There's an actual field like that where they actually study the monitor the type of sleep that you're experiencing a day, whether it is sufficient in quantity and in quality. And they advocate that in order to get good sleep, first of all, you have to develop a good, healthy habit or a healthy routine of sleep. They call it sleep hygiene. So what does sleep hygiene mean? Well, let's see what it is. Well, number one, one of the main reasons why people cannot keep a good sleep hygiene or a good routine uh, for sleep is because whenever sleep time approaches, the first thing they think about is, oh my goodness, tomorrow I have to do this, this and that. I have to go meet this person, I have to go to that place, I have to go to the market, I have to buy this, I have to sell that. And uh, the, as a result, there's a, well, the onset of sleep itself is delayed. So one way to remedy the situation where there's, uh, uh, where there's a constant fear of what is there to do is to prepare a to-do list. And in that to-do list, just write down the things that you want to do tomorrow and then tell yourself, very frankly, I'm going to think about it tomorrow. I'm going to deal with it tomorrow. Now I want to sleep. And just keep it aside. Uh, you'll see it will really induce sleep faster than anything else. Okay. And number two, at the time of sleep, sometimes it may be difficult to experience the onset of sleep. So some easy techniques uh, that are used by sleep medicine experts. Uh, one is uh, uh, doing meditation. Now, because we're all Christians, we can do something called prayerful meditation, where we focus on God and specifically on the love of God for us. What Pastor was talking about, the presence of God, that is constantly thinking of God's presence in our life. That itself is something very powerful and boosting and so uh, securing and assuring for that anyone would fall asleep in complete bliss just thinking about it. Very often we are taught to think of how much we should love God. But the truth is uh, the amount that God loves us pales, you know, it's much more in what, than what we love him. You cannot even compare the two things. Uh, another thing is to read a psalm before sleep. For example, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, or Psalm 91, uh, if I abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Those are such reassuring psalms, and they're like almost sleeping pills. The moment you read them and you believe in them in your heart and you meditate on them, it's uh, so securing and reassuring that... Uh, you feel, okay, there's nothing for me to worry about. God is there with me all the time. Uh, whatever it is, whatever happens, he, he's going to look after me. Uh, another thing that can be done is something called deep abdominal breathing, where you take deep inhalations and exhalations, around 10 or 15 of them. And that by itself, by exhaling, uh, the, when the oxygen carbon dioxide levels flood, uh, become optimum, uh, that naturally induces the sleep hormones inside the brain. So without you knowing, you'll fall into sleep if you do deep abdominal breathing around for a minute or two. All right. And the, there's certain things which you should avoid to get good quality of sleep. One is, you know, uh, avoid watching the television or using your smartphone or tablets uh, while you're lying down on bed. The reason is because the screen tends to produce light 
uh, particularly blue light, which as you can see from this picture, once it goes through the eyes, there's a direct connection between the eyes, the retina and the eyes, with a small little gland inside the center of the brain called the pineal gland. That gland is the one which secretes a hormone called melatonin. Melatonin is essential to, uh, for the onset of sleep. So uh, that hormone is secreted optimally, maximally between 12 a.m. at night to 4 a.m. in the morning. So the, when you watch the TV screen or use your mobile phone, what happens is melatonin secretion decreases. And because of which, even if you do fall asleep, when you wake up, you'll feel like your sleep is not sufficient because melatonin was simply absent during your sleep. Another thing is, especially for people who have difficulty falling asleep, they should ideally avoid any kind of stimulants containing caffeine like coffee and tea uh, four to five hours before sleep. And that can be a general rule as well. Some other miscellaneous things to help in the onset of sleep is to take a warm shower, uh, use of uh, earbuds or a, a light shade, and even something, there's a modern technology device called a white noise machine. It produces sound in every frequency in equal intensity. Uh, it's something like the sound of the fan uh, when you put it on full sp uh, speed. So that noise will help you uh, block all other kinds of noises, even your thoughts. And that will help onset of sleep as well. So these are just modern technologies that are available in the market for this. Next. Uh, recent studies have shown that even in very well-nourished people, people who are, uh, you know, by all appearance, they look healthy and fine and they eat plenty of food. Uh, what we found is that, yes, they take enough of carbohydrates, fats, uh, uh, proteins. In fact, they may take even too much of those things. But they're all, uh, you know, what's found is that majority of people are deficient in certain very important nutrients called micronutrients. They're needed only in small amounts, but nonetheless, they're very important for the health of the brain. Um, in fact, most of us walk around with deficiency in, in these vitamins, B complex, C, and certain fatty acids like omega-3. So I've made a list here of some of the things which are commonly available uh, in the market, uh, becosols as well as uh, omega-3. They're very good for the brain because you can see here a picture for a neuron the neuron is the thing inside the brain which carries the electrical signals in the brain. Uh, you can see that blue wrapping around the tail of the neuron. That blue wrapping is actually something called myelin, myelin sheath. It's a fat. And uh, that fat comes only in certain foods. And most of us are deficient in that. And uh, without that fat, the current, the electricity that the neuron carries can, uh, can get tardy. It can be reduced. But uh, even though I talk about supplementation here, you should not think that supplementation is enough. Uh, it can substitute or replace a balanced diet. That's more important. But nonetheless, supplementation helps a lot. Next. All right. Next is hydration. This is also a very important thing, which many of us, you know, are missing in our daily lives. That is, uh, did you know the fact that the brain, almost 80% of it is filled with water by weight? And the human body itself, 60% of your weight is water. Uh, the, why so much water? Well, water is the thing which actually throws out the toxic waste products that are produced during the day when you're awake. And uh, most of us drink far too less water. In fact, if you look at this MRI scan, you can see what happens. Even one hour of dehydration, you can see in those circles there, the spaces in the brain. The brain literally shrinks and spaces and gaps appear between the brain and the skull. Uh, but the good news is even one glass of water, if you take it after dehydration, uh, the rehydration process happens so fast that within 20 minutes, the brain reinflates to its former uh, position. So uh, hydration is a very, very important uh, thing. In fact, dehydration can cause headaches, it often manifests as headaches besides depression. So the, uh, the recommended amount is one to two liters per day because that's as fast as the kidneys excrete uh, urine from the body. So whatever the kidney excretes, we must at least at the minimum replace. So nothing less than one to two liters per day, which means around eight glasses on average, average glasses. That is. Now, when it comes to exercise, you know, uh, when we do exercise, what happens is you can see in this picture, that pink color gland right in the center of the brain, just like the pineal gland, there's another gland called the pituitary gland. And this pituitary gland, it secretes a hormone, a chemical hormone called endorphin. 
And endorphins have two important things to do. One is it helps in uh, suppressing pain, pain sensation. That's why when you exercise, you may experience a little pain, uh, but it suddenly disappears around a day later because the endorphins kick in. Another function that endorphins have is to actually lift the mood, elevate the mood. And it's found that just 20 minutes, that's it, just 20 minutes of uh, brisk walking, that's all it takes. Brisk walking means vigorous movement of the hands and legs um, uh, uh, for around three to five days or a week can have a huge impact on the mood within just a month's time. Uh, people with even clinical depression recover very quickly when they uh, incorporate exercise into their regimen. Yeah, this is the most uh, difficult, I think, of the entire list. The others are easy. Uh, that is avoiding negativity. And by negativity, I mean both negative people and negative self-talk. Now, why is it difficult? Because both our homes as well as our uh, workplaces may be filled with such people. So, and uh, we may be being conditioned from childhood to think always in the negative way, whatever the situation is. So, but the Bible doesn't, uh, gives an alternative. The Bible, in fact, says, Try to worry about nothing, pray about everything. Uh, another place it says, you know, uh, always count the other person as more significant than yourself. So give the other person more importance. So even if the other person, uh, rather than going and in, getting into arguments or quarrels, try to avoid them. So just for your own mental peace and, you know, for your own satisfaction so that you have a peaceful life. All right, next. Yeah, this is uh, a combination of negative self-talk. Uh, rumination simply means repeatedly thinking of things which are uh, unfavorable to you, things which, you know, it could be uh, thing, bad things that happened in the past. It could have been something that someone did to you or something that you did to someone else, feelings, uh, thoughts of grief and uh, resentment and remorse and anger and guilt. Uh, so that's called rumination. So that you have to bring that to a stop. How do you bring it to a stop? Well, the first thing is acknowledge that you're ruminating when you are ruminating. And after you acknowledge that, yes, I'm ruminating right now, I have to stop this. Stop it and replace it, substitute it with something else. And when I say something else, I mean replace it with something called gratitude. So the next slide. Yeah, so the practice of gratitude is literally the practice of the presence of God. So what does it mean, practicing gratitude? Look for any excuse, whatever it is. It could be the climate, that the climate is good. Or it could be the water that you're drinking. Oh, how nice and nourishing it is. Uh, it could be the air you're breathing. Oh, how wonderful it is. Keep thanking God and thanking your life for every single thing you can find, doesn't matter what it is, just find excuses, even if, no matter how lame it may seem, just find reasons to keep thanking God. And that's called the practice of gratitude. And my goodness, this is the most powerful uh, remedy for any kind of sulking or any kind of low feeling. And uh, the Psalms, I believe in the Bible, it says this, start each morning with this one shout, praise the Lord, this is the day that the Lord has made I shall rejoice and be glad in it. You keep repeating that. It's the best way to actually avoid going into a rumination in the day. When you wake up in the morning, first thing you do is say that. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, and I shall rejoice and be glad in it. Just doing that alone will shift your mind into a different gear from the gear of rumination. It will even prevent you from going there. It will just push you, keep you on a track, on a highway of gratitude. Next. So, uh, yeah, so if there are, I think we've reached the end of it. So if there are any questions, I suppose if we have time, we can answer that. Uh, thank you, Dr. Joseph. Uh, those, I'm sure that those practical trip tips were helpful for you. And uh, like uh, he mentioned gratitude, I think, that's really helpful if we can get into that habit of gratitude. There's nothing like that. I know that facing depression is definitely not easy. and uh, But at the same time, we don't have to be stuck where we are. We don't have to be stuck in that face or in that emotion. It helps remembering that, you know, God has a purpose for everything that he writes into our life. And aren't you glad that there is nothing that God cannot redeem? Mm -hmm. 
uh we're going to spend about 15 minutes uh taking question and answers uh we'll start with what we have we want to thank you for those of you who have sent in your questions beforehand uh we'll try to answer as many as we can now uh however in 15 minutes it's going to be difficult to cover too many questions so if we don't answer your question today please don't worry we will make sure that we reach out to you with the answers uh, after today's session either through email or through whatsapp we'll connect with you and we'll make sure that you have your answers uh for now we just have about 15 minutes and uh you can continue putting your questions into the chat box uh and if you prefer asking them directly then i encourage you to just hold on till uh, we open it up for a time for you to ask us uh at this time i also want to say i understand that it's been about an hour and a half since we've just been sitting in front of our screen so if you want to get up and stretch a bit uh while we just go into our first question you can do that and you can uh you can just probably listen to the audio and stretch around a bit if you want to go get some water or food you can do that and we'll just start answering questions for you uh i think uh Uh, Dr. Joseph, could you an, uh, answer the first question for us? It's uh, how can I identify if a person is depressed? Well, uh, yeah. So, how do you identify a person who is depressed? Well, a person who is depressed, it's not really that difficult to identify. Uh, as we saw earlier, you know, a depressed person is someone who feels helpless, hopeless, and worthless. So. uh when you uh, a person who's helpless worthless and hopeless you know how would such people look like well number one obviously they'd look like they're way withdrawn from the world they won't be interested in human company they'd rather be alone in some corner and uh, uh whenever you do see them their body language itself conveys what's going on in their head they'll be stooping they'll be slow in their movements uh they'll be tired all the time uh they may they may either be eating a lot or they may be eating too little uh the the posture itself will be affected uh, but even though these are some definitive signs of a person who's going through depression you know loss of energy social withdrawal etc uh lack of care uh it's not always very visible sometimes people can uh, to survive in this world they may even cover it up uh, by showing the opposite things that is uh uh they're trying to hide their sadness and uh their worries so it's a tricky thing trying to identify a person who's going through depression but in general these are the signs that is social withdrawal and uh, uh lack of energy basically and either the and disturbed sleep very often doctors receive patients with depression who the first complaint is i'm not able to sleep at night i'm having difficulty sleeping and uh they may even say that i just sleep 2 hours a day or 3 hours a day not more than that so those are the definitive signs of a person who's going through depression yeah uh thank you uh dr joseph i think there's also a question on uh if we can identify depression in a child and uh i'll just give you a few pointers i think uh, it's a, it's kind of an overlap from where dr joseph shared but it also can uh, be drop in grades uh, fear uh, in some sense which the child is not willing to talk about they are withdrawn they want to avoid engaging in family activities or social activities they don't want to play games uh, they may seem irritable if uh, they are in their preteen or teen years um, it could be uh, in terms of tantrums that they through sometimes you know we may mistake rebellion for requiring discipline but actually it may be something that the child is going through and we may fail to look at it um the child being unreasonable in that sense and sometimes um you know even having anic uh, uh children can go into depression when uh, there are unrealistic expectations that are there uh but yeah uh, bullying if they're going through bullying in school that could be one of the cause of depres depression so it helps to 
notice if a child is going through any of these things sometimes if you're an adult like if it's not your own child but you're noticing it in another child it helps to take initiative uh, of the problem because uh, they may be going through some form of abuse at home whether physical or uh, even you know if the if the parents are fighting or if there is some sort of mental or emotional stress at home then that could also cause depression and if you are an adult who is noticing that in a child then you must uh, definitely take initiative to help the child um i think that's about it we i mean it's an overlap apart from that to whatever uh, dr joseph said and i think uh, i'm going to ask uh, pastor vasu if you can answer this next question for us how can i help someone who's going through depression okay okay the first thing i think is to pray with them and don't you know speak words of encouragement don't judge them be available just be available be a good listener take them out for a meal take them out to the mall or to a good movie or whatever and spend time with them meaningfully okay sometimes we glibly say just get out of it no don't use those words don't over spiritualize it sometimes you don't to say it is your sin or your unbelief or because you not prayed or you didn't give tithe or you didn't you know anything like that just be a friend with them check up on them and regularly give allowance for irrational behavior be patient you sometimes they may get angry be sensitive to them you know i always say this be patient with everybody who you meet everybody is fighting a battle you know so just be available be a good friend okay thank you thank you pastor uh the next if you can answer the next question as well that will be helpful uh, how do i deal with a broken love relationship where the other person seems to have moved on faster than me okay it's difficult it is painful and it's very hurting when somebody you love moves on in life it's a love failure it can happen to all of us you know um yeah not going to miss out on god's best you're not going to so sometimes you know yeah, it could you think this you cannot live without it but you can actually don't think that your failure life is a dead end or that marriage will not work for you. remove such a preemption the room katringla the current room gatti ipdi vechirunga somebody is at the end first i'll just check on that we all fail we just have to pick up and move on you know i always tell this uh, humorously but don't take it seriously john and peter loved mary john married mary and peter lived happily ever after don't worry just release them you know in in in, in sometimes in tamil movie they say this you if if it even gets delayed late on or no latest kadikum don't worry it's okay you know the hebrew word for delay is a very nice word the hebrew word for delay is a strong person protecting you from danger yes it is painful but don't give up on life don't give up on marriage trust god god will take care of you just move on in life you know i always say this in life you have to prepare for the worst and hope for the best don't worry it is painful failures are natural comes to us but move on you know i remember the when olden days when there was no uh tv there was radio and there was a romantic scene between the boy and the girl the boy tells the girl you know the uh, says you know if i ever marry i'll marry you only the boy tells the girl and then the girl says if not what will you do i'll marry somebody else that's all so it is painful but don't give up on life god still has a plan for you and just move on thank you uh pastor next question uh, is also an important one so if you could answer that for us uh does spiritual depression happen to all of us what do i do when i go through it 
Oh, it's a very big question, and uh, all of it, uh, as, I, as I said earlier, we are just learning about this depression. We, we are, any of us are not authorities on this one. We are learning. Martin Lloyd Jones wrote a very good book on spiritual depression, and I think Anita has included some of that in the resources. So, uh, so yeah, you know, one third of the psalm is lament psalms, where the psalmist is crying. The psalmist is going through pain and agony. You know, um, sometimes we feel that. That's okay to feel that. But lament is not self-pity. Lament is saying, God, I don't understand this. Why did you allow this to happen? I, I can't understand how you love me and you're powerful and this has happened. Lament is to say, God, I don't understand, but I still love you. It's okay to feel spiritually high. It's not, it's, it's okay not to feel spiritually high all the time. Sometimes we go low. And we can't be in Mount Everest all the time. Sin, lust, unforgiveness, bitterness. Check that out. You know, in Psalm 51, restore to me the joy of thy salvation. And thou desire truth in the inward parts. In our spiritual journey, sometimes we have let allow lust, unforgiveness, bitterness, anxiety, worry to rule us. And all of these things bring us down sometimes. Not all the time. But I always feel this. Holiness is joy. But unholiness will never bring us joy and happiness. Of course, practicing the presence of God, reading your Bible, praying every day. And, you know, sometimes it is, uh, it is not, yeah, praying, but also, as I was telling about consciousness, practicing the presence of God. Dr. Joseph also referred to that. Practicing the presence of God throughout our life, every day, forgiving everybody, blessing everybody, enjoying the presence of God. It's an ongoing, continuous practice. Falling is not failure, but not raising up is the ultimate failure. We all fall. Sometimes God's presence or promise do not make sense, but hang in there. We do not live by feeling, but we live by faith. Go with the fact, and your feeling will catch up. Okay? When you cannot see God's hand, trust his heart. Sometimes as God's people, you know, sometimes even those who obey the voice of God and rely on, the, on God, we go through dark periods in our lives. But just trust God during that time. You know, there were many times, uh, you know, Martin Luther, the great reformist, Martin Luther sometimes was so depressed, he took his ink bottle that he was writing from and bashed it against the wall. So, so sometimes it's all right to feel that way, but come back to the Lord. Come back. What God does in us while we are waiting is important for him. What then, what we are waiting for. And sometimes we may not see the hand of God. And sometimes we don't see any prayer answered. Just say, God, I trust your heart. I don't see anything happen. Just I simply believe in you. So these are the spiritual, some of the things that will help you to go through the spiritual time. Spiritual depression sometimes comes even to the best of believers. Don't think something strange. You know, uh, the man who wrote the book, Happiness, you know, uh, Randy Icon. He says, I struggle with depression. It is so encouraging. A man who wrote a book on happiness struggles with depression. It's perfectly all right sometimes to go through that. God will give us grace to go through it and we can come out triumphant. Thank you. Thank From you, Pastor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. I mean, I, I don't think we have time. We're running short of time. So, uh, yeah. We, yeah, I close that, yeah. We'll, we'll probably answer that question in detail and uh, we'll reach out to uh, we'll reach out to you with the answers to it. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, I think we'll just do two more questions and close. Uh, 
Dr. Joseph, if you could answer this one, how can I avoid getting emotional or nostalgic when there are things that trigger a negative feeling? Uh, well, if, if you are aware of what the triggers are, for example, if you feel of going to a particular place or listening to a particular type of song or, uh, you know, or, or whatever the uh, trigger is, the thing which suddenly puts you into that blue mood, that mood where you feel uh, everything is hopeless and uh, miserable. If you know what they are, if you've identified them, then I think the most commonsensical thing you can do is to avoid them altogether. Uh, that would be the ideal uh, measure, the first step measure that you should take. Uh, but another thing that you should do is acknowledge that, okay, sometimes, you know, sadness does come. It's a very normal component of existence. You sh being sad is just like being joyful. But, you know, there are times when you're happy and there are times when you're sad. And when you rationalize it, what happens is you're inviting your mind and even your spirit man, your inner man to grow. Uh, in fact, pain is should be considered that way. Emotional pain should be considered as nothing more than a very strong invitation to grow as a person and mature as a spirit being. And uh, another thing that you must realize is the world isn't there to make you happy. That is something that you must tell yourself. Uh, I'm not going to wait till the world makes me happy with some good circumstance. I'm going to make myself happy. It's a deliberate process. It's a proactive process. It's it's a very intentional and planned process. It's a very conscious process. It's not something that will happen by itself one day by some uh, auspicious moment. It's something which you have to decide here and now. Uh, so uh, avoiding triggers is one. Another is making that proactive choice that I'm going to be happy regardless of the circumstances. Uh, that's the second thing that should be done. And then practice of gratitude, because the moment you practice gratitude, something happens in the spiritual realm. You open the doors for God to bless you. Uh, where the moment you start thanking him for everything that he's done for you. Uh, he, uh, God is our heavenly father. And when he sees that we're living in gratitude, that by itself is a very, uh, what do you call a spiritually rewarding exercise. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Joseph. Uh, before we go on, on to the last in, uh, we just want to uh, ask you to fill out a feedback form for us. Uh, your input would be really valuable to us and it will only take a minute of your time. So we'd appreciate it if you can use the link that's been posted on the uh, chat box. Uh, Anita, I think you have to post it to everyone. And if you can just fill that out or you can copy paste that into your browser and you can fill it right after this uh, uh, session as well. We just really appreciate uh, hearing back from you. Uh, we also have some resources put together in a file. Uh, it includes some of what we discussed today and some of the uh, input that uh, Dr. Joseph has given us. We've included it in it. Uh, you can download that as well. Uh, you can save it and uh, that uh, that would also be useful to you. Uh, for our last question, Pastor, if you can answer this for us, uh, what is the best e uh, best and easiest way to overcome depression? We have to oh say my. it in short. <laughs> oh my! Okay, from hopelessness, move to hope. Actually, from helplessness, move to a feeling of empowered and strengthened by God. From joylessness, practice gratitude. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Happiness and gladness. From feeling of worthlessness, you know, from feeling of worthlessness, knowing and embracing your worth and your position in Christ. I, th I think we have not even scratched the surface of what we are, how precious we are. You know, one of the things that changed my life is Isaiah 43, 4. He says, since you're precious in my sight, you're honored and I love you. That changed a lot for me. It just changed a lot for me. So from hopelessness, move to hope. From helplessness to feel empowered. From joylessness, practice gratitude and worthlessness to move on to realize how wonderful you are in Christ. I mean... 
I always say this, God loves you, but I am God's pet. You need to say that. You need to say you are God's pet. And once you realize more and more of his love, a lot of these things will change. Thank you.